How do you know that you're pretty and not hot? I'll start. A guy has never come up to me and asked for my phone number, but a mom who wants me to be her babysitter has. It was being able to make male friends who just wanted to be platonic, even though I secretly wished that they would like romanticize or sexualize me because that added to my worth as a human being apparently. It was being incredibly jealous of any other girl in any given situation and spending an inordinate amount of time prettying myself up. It was going to everyday places like the grocery store or the bank and sort of hoping that some handsome stranger would notice me across the grocery aisle and then like walk up to me and be like, hey, here I am validating your body insecurities by saying that I personally think that you're attractive enough to talk to. And then when that didn't happen, it was going home from the grocery store feeling ugly and you know, like why couldn't I get approached like all the other girls that are talking about this? I now, okay, okay, I just have to put a disclaimer. I now know that that is not, we're gonna get into it, okay? This was immature Jasmine. Maybe I should just retitle the video, growing up shallow. Growing up being taught that looks are the only value that I have as a woman. To be honest, my experience of being kind of pretty to some people and kind of average to other people was like trying to search for what was going to fix me, what was going to make me beautiful and normal and accepted and loved, I guess. Yeah. Never mind that outer beauty is literally just what your human meat suit happens to look like and it all depends on your genetics and your environment and where you were born and what trauma you probably had to deal with growing up. You know, all of these like health factors that you're not really in control of. So I now know it's completely unfair to judge someone based on their appearance. We're gonna get into it. And you know, all of these like unconventionally attractive going against societal standards, like having a bigger nose, thinner lips, huge forehead, I'm fine, I'm fine. If you're not like a perfectly symmetrical Barbie model that has amazing features that conform to what society says is attractive, then you're sort of given all of these solutions. Gummy vitamins, hair masks, 10-step skincare process, healthcare to pay for a dermatologist visit. And if you can't pay for the dermatologist visit, then I guess you're just gonna go to the drugstore, fool around with a bunch of the products there and spend tons of money that no man would ever spend on skincare. Like, I've done all this. I'm not, like, am I even condemning it? I've done all this. Or if you don't like your body, up your protein and really research your health. Not because you actually want to be healthy, not because you want to feel better, but because you want to look a certain way, because you want to gain lean muscle and like have this perfect hourglass body shape, you know, how to grow your glutes. Well, some of these solutions are genuinely helpful. I can't help but think that they're just promoting a serious investment of time into something that doesn't have to be important to you. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was going through Instagram and I saw what was titled the incel attractiveness scale. It's basically a chart outlining how attractive you are and how attractive of a partner you can get based on your attractiveness and your gender. And it's kind of saying it's a lot harder for men to find an attractive woman than it is for an attractive woman to find a man. It's basing relationships on looks and treating just people in general like objects, whether they be ugly objects or beautiful objects. I had heard the term incel before. I knew that it was sort of like this dark, gross subculture of whiny men. I realized that I had lived a lot of my childhood and teen years by their rules. So when I saw this incel attractiveness scale chart, it was sort of being confronted with all of the lies. And when I saw this scale, I almost laughed because I was like, this is ridiculous. This isn't how humans work. Like I've mentioned it a couple times on this channel. I grew up on rom-coms. And when I was growing up, you really only saw one kind of romantic interest lead in mainstream rom-coms or even intelligent romantic films. A cute, quirky guy in a bookshop. And really, that just means a conventionally attractive man. You know, maybe he's kind of skinny. He looks artistic. 
he has glasses on like Timothy Chalamet basically. Growing up watching this meet cute you know being like oh my gosh what if I meet the one that way now I know that the one doesn't even exist but every time I would go to a public place like the mall a library Barnes and Noble a restaurant I'd be like what if I meet the one. The thing was, if I didn't feel an immediate spark, if I didn't feel butterflies in my stomach when I was talking to someone for the first time, I, I would completely write them off. And when I stepped back and I thought about it, butterflies to me meant that I was afraid that they would reject me and then also being enamored by their beauty. So it would be a combination of this superficial ideal of what I wanted, you know, a potential partner to look like. And then also the fact that they would be emotionally unavailable in the relationship or that they would play hard to get or something like that. And that's what created that anxious energy that I labeled as butterflies for a really long time until I met Henry. We were just sort of friends. Through a couple of weeks, we got like really close. Even though I wasn't immediately physically attracted to him, like he was the complete opposite of my usual type I really fell for him and even though like it didn't work out it didn't work out because of other things in the relationship his looks it wasn't even a it wasn't even a thing it didn't even matter in the end <laughs> Ago, I picked up Dita Von Teese's book, Your Beauty Mark. And if you don't know who Dita Von Teese is, she's basically a burlesque superstar. I love kind of who she is as a, as a person, her philosophy for life. She seems very mentally and emotionally and physically healthy. So she wrote this book exposing all of her beauty secrets. Now, a healthy person reading this book probably would have, you know, read the book and then taken one or two tips for their own life and fit it in to their personality and their schedule. But when I read it, it was basically like a manual on how to turn into Dita Bontis. This sort of happens with me. Like whenever I think of a female role model, you know, fashion or makeup icon, I'm like, how do I do exactly what you do? Because you seem happy. So if I turn into you, I will also be happy. The thing is, Dita Bontis is very disciplined that's all that i can describe it as incredibly disciplined and diligent she's also in her late 40s so she's been doing this routine this upkeep for a long time and i'm 23 like i'm at the very start of my life trying to form all these habits her look does take effort and it takes a certain tolerance for discomfort she does pilates for an hour every day she puts her hair up in curlers all the time she never wears sweats she constantly wears heels and lipstick and you know applies sunscreen and drinks a green smoothie every day and and when i first read this book i really tried and for the next year i would spend hours every morning with multiple devices trying to figure out the most easy efficient solution for my like medium length thin dry simultaneously oily hair i would try hair masks straightening it curling it foam rollers hot rollers i would do that like bathrobe thing that those girls do on tiktok i would air dry it try to do the classic blowout i tried getting layers cut in my hair i tried cutting layers myself into my hair. Um, that was a mistake. And at some point I had to figure out my motivation for all of this. Why did I want to have long and shiny hair so badly? Why was I spending so much time and money and effort and stress on my hair? And ultimately I realized I was doing it because I wanted romantic validation. So if we're answering the question of who I was doing all this work for, it sure wasn't me. I recently read this book by Elizabeth Benedict and it's called Me, My Hair and I, and I'm gonna read an excerpt from that. In Benedict's book, a woman writes, I blew my hair out every day, was quaffed and immaculate, the very picture of a trophy wife. In my affluent Connecticut town, trying to fit in, I wanted to be the Stepford wife wanted to pretend to be the housewife, married to the successful husband, lunching with the girls. Whenever I hear people talking about what's so great about women, what they love about being a woman, it almost seems to me like we're relaying what society taught us to be. What does it mean just to be a person, not a glamorous size two 
curvaceous somehow baby making machine. An attribute I hear women constantly being praised for is their beauty. But how could they not be? When huge corporations on social media monetize, you know, a woman's beauty with an Instagram aesthetic, who takes credit for that beauty and meeting that beauty standard? Would women be as put together and beautiful without all of these expectations to do your makeup, bikini waxes, threading, eyebrow appointments, manicures, pedicures. Who are we doing all of this for? And who would we be without all of these feminine rituals? If they're even feminine, what is femininity? <laughs> I'd also like to point out the beautiful dead mother trope. Nearly in any film, when the mother dies beforehand, she is always very kind and very beautiful, as if those are synonymous. Cher's mother in Clueless, Betty's mother in Mad Men, Miley's mother in Hannah Montana, Cinderella's mother in Cinderella, just to name a few. Let's think about this. How many times have you heard the phrase, boys will be boys? <laughs> The reason that girls are so mature is because they are conditioned to, because they were taught to because they were expected to. We were indoctrinated into the experience that is being female. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's just a lot of expectation, a lot of very high standards, and a lot of ducks that you have to keep in a row when men are just sort of fed a very simplistic standard, a very high standard to be manly and to not be emotional at all, which is difficult. Women have all of these different things that they have to keep in line, that they have to multitask. And are we decorating ourselves in these feminine expectations because we have taken our power back? Are we applying makeup just for the fun of it? Or are we doing it so we don't look sick when we, whenever we go into the office? Or so our date will think we're at our premium level of beauty you know, when we put on those false eyelashes. Even if we have, you know, psychologically taken our power back with the whole makeup thing and, you know, if we only do it because we want to have fun, are we still donating our hard-earned money to a billion dollar industry that profits off of telling women that they're not good enough naturally, that they're not good enough as they are? So basically, how I decided to combat <laughs> some of this was to just consider myself as a human being and to prioritize some things. I probably went into the hairdressers and I got a pixie cut and I never looked back and I I don't regret it. Just when I think about how much I had to stress about my long hair, it's ridiculous and it's not worth whatever man <laughs> would have been interested in me with my long hair, supposedly. In reality, there was never anything to fix. I was okay as I was, as I am. Yeah.